Hello everyone. Um, we have passed our three quarter point of the challenge um, and I've cheated very, very slightly in this quarterly review simply because 275 was the, well, it wasn't the exact three quarter mark, it was 274 and a half. So I've rounded up to 275 as three quarters. Um, but I had one more Japanese whiskey left to do. So um, I'm, I've actually waited until I've done that one to include that in the Japanese, which I'm going to um, do as a separate category in my awards ceremony. And um, so we're actually looking at Dram's uh, number 184 to number 276, not 275. Um, I'm just going to jot down that one because it is actually going to be included 276. So I'll try and run through it relatively quickly. Um, what I'm going to do is um, we'll do, because we had, uh, because I've got all the samples I needed, I've been able to then combine everything into runs. So I've done Irish, we'll have an Irish section. I've done Canadian, we'll have a Canadian awards. We'll have a Japanese one. Um, I'll do the most surprising and the most disappointing as I have done with the other ones. Um, I did a run of Scotch blended whiskey as well as I think it was the end of um, the Highland whisk, the Highland single malts and a couple of grains and some blended malts as well. So what I'm going to do, the first one, first category that I'll do is, um, and it's not best, and I can't, I was going to share this out earlier, I can't remember if on the first two quarterly reviews I did, I called them best Scotch and best uh, American and what have you. And with all this palaver about Jim Murray's whiskey, world whiskey of the year and all of this lot, I shouldn't have actually called it the best. What I should be calling it is my favourite because it's my favourite with my tastes. So it's not the best of the 90 odd that I've done in this last quarter. It's my favourite out of those. That's what it is. Don't let that influence you in thinking that you should like them, that you should instantly go out and buy them. They're my favourites. If you found watching my videos that you like, you seem to like the ones that you've had that I quite like as well, then it's probably worth checking them out. But that doesn't mean that you're going to like these ones because everybody has completely different tastes. So, favourite scotch that's not a blended whisky. So, Highland single malt, uh, blended malt, and grain whiskies. So, um, 180, Dram 188, Hazelburn, um, which uh, was the peated Campbelltown whisky, um, and uh, basically um, Springbank, Hazelburn, Long Road. They're just all amazing. They're all absolutely fantastic. Um, 192, the Crofton Gayer, Crofton Hayer, um, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society bottling that I got from Chris and Lindsay Cook, um, which was the peated version of the Lot Lomond distillery, um, was again, surprised the hell out of me. Absolutely fantastic stuff. Uh, very, very lucky to get hold of it um, and tasted wonderful. 197, Glen Cadden, um, which is just a really, really solid Highland single malt whiskey. It just it's just really well made. You can tell they're taking care over it, and it just does exactly what it says on the tin. It it really is a good one. Um, Two one nine hedonism, the um, grain from Compass Box, um, which is still phenomenally good, and I would recommend you put that on any whiskey tasting you do with anybody, and don't tell them what it is. Let them try and figure out what it is because you'll it'll be surprise them that it's a grain. Um, but also just the quality of it. It's absolutely fantastic. And then 244, again from Compass Box. Technically, I shouldn't have done two from the same brand, but Spice Tree, which is the blended mall. Phenomenal stuff, absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm very, very, very tempted at the end of the challenge to do a run of hopefully get in touch with Compass Box and see if they'll send me some samples of all the other Compass Boxes that they do, or the ones that you can get hold of at least, and do a, a a run of them just compass box separately once the, the challenge is finished because they seem to all be amazing and if they all are then that will be something else so if I pick a favorite out of the favorites it's a bit of a difficult one to be honest I probably would go with the hedonism simply because grain unusual but it's so good it's been consistently good I've had it a number of times over the last few years and it's always been brilliant and I think if I was going to say to somebody, if you want a Scotch whiskey that's different but is really, really high quality, then get the hedonism. Go for it. Go check it out. So, um, blended Scotch whiskey, um, which was interesting because there was a few in there 
that I wasn't really having my hopes up, to be perfectly honest. Uh, my favourites out of that, um, Drown 223, uh, Bailey Nickel Jarvie or BNJ, which I've, I've always loved and I was really glad to um, find out it was as good as I remember. High mall content really makes a difference. Such a shame they discontinued it. I really, really hope they bring it back. My fear is if they do bring it back, it's gonna be nowhere near as good. Um, label lets it down a little bit, but the whiskey itself is phenomenal. And if you can find it anywhere, and you want a blended whiskey, it's worth getting hold of, although you're probably gonna be paying over the odds for it now. Uh, Dram 225 was the Crawford's Five Star, which um, I don't even think you can get that anymore. Um, I've no idea what the three stars are like, which seems to be the, the sort of entry level version. This was an old bottling, and I actually think that was probably the key as to why it was so good, was it was quite an old release. And not that it had changed in bottle, but it, I do get the impression that whiskies from kind of the 60s and 70s, blended whiskies in particular, weren't churned out as much. They had more care. They had there was more flavour generally in Scotch whiskey at that time of um, at that time of year, at, at kind of that time period, um, and it was amazing. I mean, it was fantastic to even have the bottle and open it. I think it was 1970s, but it was it was just incredible. Again, I'm guessing high malt content. Um, number 237, Stewart's Cream of the Barley, which I'll be honest, I didn't have much high hopes for. Um, but that one's going to stick with me because I can remember my thought process going through what it tasted like and then remembering Cranachan and it being very much like Cranachan. Cream, meringue, um, raspberries and oats. Um, and it was lovely, absolutely lovely stuff. Um, and then 239, Chevec. Um, again, another blended whiskey which I've always highly rated and really enjoyed when I've had it in the past. That peaty influence, that kind of like peat and talisker influence is, is something I love anyway. So it's, it's kind of going to float my boat regardless. Um, but just a really good, a good blended whiskey that's good value for money. You know, you're getting some really good kind of peaty flavours in there for a lower price than you would if you were looking at single malts. If I were to pick a favourite out of them, it's a bit of a close call, really, between BNJ and Chevec. I'm probably going to go with BNJ. I've got more of a soft spot for it. I know it's hard to get hold of. I know it's discontinued, but it means a bit more to me personally. So I'm probably going to go with that. I'm just really relieved it's as good as I remember. So we then moved on to Canadian. So favourite Canadians, and I'll be honest, Canadian whiskey didn't really rock my world. I didn't do that many of them. I think it was about 10 of them. And the majority of them were the lower end, kind of predominantly made to be mixed. So Canadian Club and Canadian Mist and things like that, where it was kind of like, we're making it for you to drink with Coke and in cocktails and things like that. So there, aren't, there wasn't really many that kind of jumped out at me when I was looking back at them. Um, 212, the Good Room Work small batch was really, really good. And what I found out subsequently is the version that I had, you can't get anymore. They have another version. Um, I can't remember for the life of me what the name of it is, but it is another version. I don't know whether it's as good. Somebody did say it's not quite as good as the old small batch. Um, but that was fantastic. Really, really impressed with that. Uh, 213, the lot 40, um, which was the rye whiskey, I seem to remember. Also very, very good indeed. Um, very impressed with that. Again, kind of small batch and um, yeah, top draw stuff. 215 Pendleton was the one out of the kind of lower end, more to be mixed type price range, but was drinkable on its own. And if I was going to go for a low end Canadian, if I was looking at like, you know, bottom shelf Canadian, that would be the one that I go for, even though it's from Oregon, strictly speaking. Um, and then the uh, 217, the Potter's Indian Corn, which was just really unusual. Um, very, very distinctive. Um, just the story behind it, how it was found, what they'd used, everything like that, but worked really well. Just a really, yeah, really unusual, weird whiskey, which I always kind of tend to go for because it stands out more. Uh, pick one of them out of them, Ben. Um, favorite of the favorites? Probably Lot 40 to be honest. That's the one that really stood out. Um, I did like that, and that's one that I would try and get a bottle of if I can find one. So then we moved on to Irish, and um, Irish generally I was, I was pleasantly surprised by. 
it's it's not as much of a, a range outside of Connemara. Um, it's it's not that it's much of a muchness, but it doesn't have too much diversity in terms of Irish whiskey. But there were some real pleasant whiskies, really nice ones to drink. Two five two Kilkerran, uh, Kilkerran, Kilbegan, um, really surprised me because it was there was much more of a tropical um, fruit feel to it than I than I thought there ever would be. Um, really, really nice, really drink, drinkable, really light almost fresh, very, very quaffable, even though I, I don't really like that phrase. Um, 255, The Quiet Man, never heard of it, got a sample of it from the Whiskey Lounge, and was just a very solid Irish whiskey, really well made. Um, you know, clearly kind of like, picked well, well you know, chosen, because I'm sure that was from Cooley Distillery um, that they'd sourced it from, but um, bodes well for future releases. Um, 259, Connemara, um, the peated Irish, which I I've liked for a long time, and uh, it was as good as I remember it, um, was absolutely fantastic. Um, really, really impressed with that. Two six two green ore, um, the the single grain is now um, Kilbegan single grain, so it is still available. Green ore is gone as a brand; they've brought it into the Kilbegan family. So there is an eight year old Kilbegan single grain, and do get hold of it; it's absolutely fantastic. They kept the sexy bottle as well; they've just changed the label on it. Um, so as a present and a really good whiskey, absolutely fantastic. And then 266, the red breast, uh, cash strength red breast. Now, it was slightly curtailed, admittedly, um, the review that I did by the fact that I thought my uh, kids were playing around upstairs, but it turned out that my wife was walking around upstairs ready to change our new baby's nappy. So I curtailed it for no reason whatsoever, and I wish I'd spent more time on that review because it was phenomenal. It was as good as I hoped it was going to be. I love red breasts. I'd heard cash strength was better, and it was. Um, so there is some cracking whiskies in that lineup, but I still have to go with red breast. It's it's been one of my top whiskies generally, even outside of Irish. Just a you know top ten whiskey, probably even top five. Cash strength red breast tops that, um, not by much. They're both fantastic whiskies, and Redbreast is just absolutely brilliant. Um, Japanese, um, only twelve of them, and struggled really. Um, it was it was a little. I was a little bit disappointed with the Japanese whiskies. The Hibiki Harmony, really really impressed. Uh, that was two six seven. Very very nice indeed. I thought it was pretty decent value for money. The bottle is absolutely gorgeous. So in terms of the package, it's fantastic. Then two six eight, the Nikka Allmall, which was even cheaper and arguably as good as the Hibiki. Um, blended whiskey even though it's all more as opposed to the blend that's the hibiki um, and just gave it a bit more depth but still really really light really easy drinking um, 271 the takatsuru blew me away Re that was a surprise that really was um, you know considering it's the combination of yoichi and miyagi kyo it's it had the best combinations of those two distilleries and none of the stuff that made the other two slightly disappointing um, and then 276, the actual, you know, technically in the fourth quarter, Hakushu, fantastic whiskey. Um, years since I've had it, had stuck in my head for that, that long because I remember absolutely loving it and it's still as good. It's still fantastic. Crisp, fresh, appley, slightly smoky, beautiful stuff. Um, it's a bit of a tough one because I have just had the Hakushu and that's lingering with me. But I think the Takatsuru, because of the price compared to the Hakushu, the Takatsuru 12, I think edges it. I think if you can find that, if you can find Takatsuru 12, I think they do an OA statement as well, but I would go for the 12 year old. If you can get your hands on that, I would do so as a fantastic example of Japanese whiskey as well. As a kind of, if you're looking for, somebody says to you, what's Japanese whiskey like? I think that hits the nail on the head in terms of delicate, finesse, quality, care, attention to detail, that sort of thing. That's what the Takasura had. So, um, the most surprising, um, which was a bit of a tricky one really, because there wasn't, there wasn't many that kind of really threw me for a loop. Um, 186, the Bibb and Tucker Bourbon. Um, I think the bottle is absolutely fantastic, and my fear was it was going to be a, st a case of style over content, um, and it wasn't. Phenomenal bourbon, absolutely loved the stuff. If it had been in the um, 
Q2 section, which was predominantly bourbons, it would have been up there as favourite bourbon, even maybe even favourite of favourites. It was absolutely brilliant stuff. Um, 227, famous grouse. Was, I haven't touched it in donkey's years. In fact, I can't even remember when I've drunk it. Turn my nose up it, think it's... Um, it, it's terrible stuff, it sells by the bucket loads, it's advertised on TV, everybody buys it. There's stacks of the stuff at Christmas, it's got to be rubbish because it's 10 quid a litre at supermarkets. And it was actually all right. Not mind-blowingly good, but decent. A, a very, very decent whiskey. Very solid, does what you want a good whiskey to do. And I think, as I said at the time, if I was in a bar and I wanted a shot of whiskey, and I wasn't mixing it because I tend not to mix it anyway. But if I fancied a whiskey and that was the only thing behind the bar, I would buy it. Bells, touch and go. Grouse, yeah, I'd have a shot of it. Wouldn't have a problem. If there was something else, maybe like Jameson's or... I would have it over Jack Daniels. Probably would have Jameson's instead of Grouse. But if there was anything else that was a little bit more interesting, I would probably go for that. But if I was in a pub and that was the only whiskey behind the bar, or if it was Bell's Grouse and Jack Daniels, and it was, right, I fancy a shot of whiskey. Actually, they've got Grouse, I'll have it. Bell's and Jack Daniels, probably not. I'd probably still stood clear of it, but I wouldn't have an issue going for Grouse, which is was really surprising to me. Um, 255, The Quiet Man, more because I knew nothing about it, had never heard anything from it, and it was a surprisingly good whiskey, a very, very good, solid Irish whiskey. Um, and 271, the Takatsuru, simply because um, I was expecting it to be the, the lesser of the two parts that are within it. Um, it was relatively new to me. It was a whiskey that I've never had before, and it was, out of all of them, probably the most Japanese whiskey out of the Japanese whiskies that I had. But, in terms of most surprising, and it's probably fairly obvious considering how much time I spent talking about it compared to the other three, it's got to be the grouse. It's, it really did. It was, it was one of the, out, in, in fact, you could almost say it's one of the most surprising out of the whole challenge so far, about all 276, because I had such low expectations of it. I really was expecting nothing from it. And it really, and I think I probably over-egged how good I thought it was because I was coming from such a low base. And then the biggest disappointment. Um, and it's a bit of a difficult one, this, because there haven't really been any big disappointments in terms of my expectations of them have been fairly low to start with. So Bells, I wasn't expecting much, and it really wasn't that good. There have been a few others as well where it's like, mm, okay, that's, you know, I don't think it's going to be that good. Actually, no, it's not as good as I thought. The Canadians, you know, Canadian Club, Canadian Mist, I didn't have much low expect. I didn't have... Very high expectations of it and they weren't that good they, but they matched it it wasn't that they were a disappointment so I've only got two um, 246 Monkey Shoulder which gets a bit of a bad reputation um, with kind of hardcore whiskey drinkers but looking at looking at its constituent parts looking at what's gone into it it should be so much better you've got Glenfiddich you've got Balvenie you've got Kininvi you've got something else I'm sure maybe it's just them three but you've got some absolutely cracking base whiskies going into that. And it just, there was just nothing, nothing at all. It was so bland. And it wasn't even, it was, you know, Hay Club-esque levels of bland that won't even work in a cocktail. There was just nothing to it. It was so, so there that made it such a disappointment because I thought it can't be that bad, surely. And it's not bad. There's, it's just empty, it's soulless. Um, and then the other one, which is probably fairly obvious, um, because I think I've made my feelings on it pretty clear, 270 Fujikai. A disappointment because I'd not had it before. It was a Japanese whiskey, so you kind of hope that it should be okay. Then I read things um, and heard things from other people saying, it is absolutely awful. And I thought to myself, it can't be that bad. It honestly can't be that bad. It can't be as awful as what it seemed like everybody is saying. And it was. In fact, it was worse. And it's such a disappointment because there is a kernel, such a small kernel of a half decent whiskey that is surrounded by, and I've said this a number of times, surrounded by a mountain of shit. And 
I cannot understand how everybody that worked on that whiskey and went through the distillation process and put it into casks and tasted it and kept it and got it to the point where they went, yes, let's bottle it. That's how we want it. And how they got the flavors that are in there of burnt rubber and diesel and plimsolls and vomit and wet dog and sweaty underpants and everything that belongs in hell into a liquid form that somebody went, yeah, bottle it. We're going to sell that. It just defies belief. And that's, that's the disappointment behind it. Was I could, I, my disappointment was the fact that everybody said it was terrible and I try and give everything a chance. I try and look on the positive and go, it can't be that bad, surely. And it was worse than that. It was dreadful, dreadful stuff. And I've had, you know, there'd been people that come back and said, well, I now want to try it because I can't believe it's that bad. Go, go and try it. Please do go and try it. I'm still trying to find somebody that's gone, no, actually, it's okay. Because I want to know what they think of it. I want to know if they like it, what it is that they like about it. Um, but I haven't found anybody yet. Um, and like I say, it's probably worth getting a bunch of friends together and going, right, we'll all throw a fiver in the pot, we'll get a bottle of this, and we'll sit around the dinner table, we'll have a couple of other drams, or we'll have this one first, yeah, you have that one first, and we'll, we'll try it, and we'll all do tasting notes, and we'll just have a laugh with it. And if there's somebody that likes it, let's find out why it is they like it. Don't take the piss out of them, because they like it, good for them. But what is it that they get that no, you know, they're not, everybody else is getting. And, and what is it, because there's so many weird flavors in there. I'd love to know what other people kind of get from it. You know, I've had diesel engine. Um, somebody did say it was like, uh, it's like Panzer diesel oil and things like this. It's just, it's bonkers. It's just dreadful. So biggest disappointment out of those two, it's got to be the Fujikai because it's a shit whiskey. There's no such thing as a bad whiskey, the phrase goes. There is such a thing as a shit whiskey. It's Fujikai. That's me done. I'm going to do a short little video, but while I'm here, I'll also mention that um, I still have the auction running because that's going to go till the end of the challenge for the litre bottle of um, Johnny Walker Black Label that I've got. Now, I do actually have this dated now. Um, there is a very, very cool website that um, talk about bottles and about the, the marks that are on the bottle. You might not be able to see it. I'm not sure how good the light is. Um, but there's like marks on the bottom here and this website actually tells you what it means um, and then dates it for you. So there is a, um, a, a UG in a hexagon at the bottom of this, which is from United Glass Products. UG in hexagon, United Glass Products. The date range is from 1959 to 1968. So that age is this bottle between 1959 and 1968. This is a, a store for the um, Naffy stores for Her Majesty's Forces, a uh, litre bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label. At the moment, I've had one bid so far uh, for £10. So once this is sold, half of it goes to the people who own this, and the other half is going to go in towards the charity. So at the moment, uh, Vin at No Nonsense Whiskey, he was the one that put the bid in. Um, and if you've not watched his videos, do go and subscribe to his uh, YouTube channel. Um, he has got this so far for 10 quid from you know a 1960s bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label, which is a ridiculous price and should be worth more. So um, go and check out the um, blog, which is, crap, I've completely forgotten it. It's on my um, Tumblr page, uh, adramaday.tumblr.com. I'm going to do a separate little video as an update for this anyway, so I'll put the proper address up there. It's something like JW Black Auction thing. Um, but that's it. Q3 done. We are nearly, nearly at the end. Only another 92? 90? I don't know. 90? Whatever. Um, yeah, not many. Not many. He says, with 60 space sides stretching out in front of him. I'm gonna get sick of Speyside whiskey. I've got a bad feeling I'm gonna get sick of it. Right, I shall see you at Dram 277. See you then, cheers.